See one, do one, teach one. This expression has been the foundation of surgical training for over a century, but unfortunately, it's no longer working. Our system of training is an apprenticeship method. You spend your five to nine years post-medical schools following other experienced surgeons around, observing them, learning to do what they do. This worked for a time, especially when the number of procedures we needed to learn was very small, residents had a lot of hands-on time with patients, and they had a significant amount of autonomy. Today, the world has changed. Residents have an enormous number of procedures they need to learn, and those procedures are now more complicated thanks to new technologies like robotics, 3D printing, and navigation. To give you an example, one study questioned the leaders of surgery across the country and asked them, what are the critical procedures that residents need to learn? They identified 171 surgeries that residents should know how to do by the time they leave residency and go into independent practice. But when they actually looked at the surgeries that th those residents did by the time that they graduated, they found that many of the procedures they had done once, twice, or zero times. Additionally, the time residents have to operate is becoming less. Work hour restrictions have limited residents to only 80 hours of work a week. <laughs> All right, they're so lazy. <laughs> But amazingly, they've lost a year of training time that they previously had. Workflow changes like electronic medical record systems have residents in front of a computer for almost 50% of their time instead of in front of a patient. Finally, culture is changing. People are more aware of what residents do and don't want them touching them, so residents have less autonomy and less hands-on time. Sometimes there's a situation where you see something you've never seen before, so it's not even see one, do one, it's just do one. Like this time, where we received a call from the zoo and there was a gorilla that was injured and needed surgery. Now, you may be wondering, why was the zoo calling a team of very human surgeons who take care of people to operate on a gorilla? And that's a story for another time. But we jumped to answer the call. Now, the zoo couldn't tell us what was wrong with the gorilla because they had to tranquilize it, take it to x-ray, and then immediately to the operating room. So we were walking into the operating room in the zoo with no clue what to expect. Amazingly, the gorilla did great. It was a really wonderful experience but I had to think there had to be a better way to practice just in time for those cases when a gorilla comes in through the door. <laughs> so how are we doing today? A study from Brian George answered that question. They looked at residents' ability to practice independently over all five years of their training. The results may shock you. At the end of their training, 30.7% of residents were still unable to operate independently. I've seen this surgical training gap firsthand during my own surgical residency. Believe it or not, I often was asked to Google the surgery we were doing to find the instruction manual. The blistering pace of new technology and procedures aren't just affecting residents anymore. They're affecting surgeons out in practice. It is not uncommon to see a site like this in the operating room, where surgeons are operating on a patient with instructions folded out on them as they work. At the conclusion of his paper, Brian George states that the residency system that we know it today no longer works. To make matters worse, sorry to be so negative, <laughs> it gets better, is that we have an aging population, and they're going to need more and more surgery. We have a surgeon shortage coming, and we're going to be short 50,000 surgeons in just a few decades. So what do we do? What if I told you there was a technology that allows you to practice a procedure anytime and anywhere? in a safe, repeatable way? Well, there is. That technology is virtual reality, or VR. Let's take a look.
Now remember, VR did not start as a toy. It started as a serious scientific tool for NASA. Today, no aircraft pilot can operate a commercial jet without first learning their skills in a simulator and passing a battery of tests. In aviation, when it's life or death, simulators are not tomorrow's luxury. They are today's necessity. So why should it be any different in the medical world? In a future with VR simulation, we can bridge the training gap so our graduating residents are ready to practice independently. In a future with VR simulation, we could train more surgeons faster so we can tackle the oncoming surgeon shortage. In a future with VR simulation, surgeons would only do procedures that it was safe for them to do so they wouldn't be Googling the operation during the procedure. We've already made big steps in this brave new reality. In a pilot study, we took a group of students and trained them in VR. We then took them and tested them on the real surgical procedure. And we were surprised with the results. The VR trained group nearly doubled the surgical performance scores of non-VR trained individuals. VR surgical training is scalable, affordable, and most importantly, it works. With this technology, the next generation of surgeons will be ready for whatever comes through the door. <laughs>